20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part 1. Chapter 1. A Shifting Reef. In the year 1866 was signalized by a remarkable incident, a mysterious and puzzling phenomenon, which doubtless no one has yet forgotten not to mention rumors which agitated the maritime population and excited the public mind. Even in the interior of continents, seafaring men were particularly excited. Merchants, common sailors, captains of vessels, skippers, both of Europe and America, naval officers of all countries and the governments of several states on the two continents, were deeply interested in the matter. For some time past vessels had been met by an enormous thing, a long object, spindle-shaped, occasionally phosphorescent, and infinitely larger and more rapid in its movements than a whale. The facts relating to this apparition entered in various log books agreed in most respects as to the shape of the object or creature in question, the untiring rapidity of its movements, its surprising power of locomotion, and the peculiar life with which it seemed endowed. If it was a whale, it surpassed in size all those hitherto classified in science. Taking into consideration the means of observations made at diverse times, rejecting the timid estimate of those who assigned to this object a length of 200 feet, equally with the exaggerated opinions which set it down as a mile in width and three in length we might fairly conclude that this mysterious being surpassed greatly all dimensions admitted by the learned ones of the day, if it existed at all, and that it did exist was an undeniable fact, and with that tendency which disposes the human mind in favor of the marvelous, we can understand the excitement produced in the entire world by this supernatural apparition. As to classing it in the list of fables, the idea was out of the question. On the 20th of July, 1866, the steamer Governor Higgins and of the Calcutta and Burnock Steam Navigation Company, had met this moving mass five miles off the east coast of Australia. Captain Baker thought at first that he was in the presence of an unknown sand bonk. He even prepared to determine its exact position when two columns of water projected by the mysterious object, shot with a hissing noise a hundred and fifty feet up into the air. Now, unless the sand bonk had been submitted to the intermittent eruption of a geyser, the governor Higgins and had to do neither more nor less than with an aquatic mammal, unknown till then which threw up from its blowholes columns of water mixed with air and vapor. Similar facts were observed on the 23rd of July in the same year, in the Pacific Ocean, by the Columbus, of the West India and Pacific Steam Navigation Company. But this extraordinary creature could transport itself from one place to another with surprising velocity, as, in an interval of three days, the Governor Higgins and, and the Columbus had observed it at two different points of the chart, separated by a distance of more than 700 nautical leagues. Fifteen days later, 2,000 miles farther off, the Helvetia, of the company Nashvindale, and the Shannon, 
of the Royal Mail Steamship Company, sailing to windward in that portion of the Atlantic lying between the United States and Europe respectively signaled a monster to each other in 42 degrees 15 minutes north latitude and 60 degrees 35 minutes west longitude in these simultaneous observations they thought themselves justified in estimating the minimum length of the magma at more than 350 feet as the Shannon and Helvetia were of smaller dimensions than it, though they measured 300 feet overall. Now the largest whales, those which frequent those parts of the sea round the Aleutian, Kulamak, and Umgullet Islands, have never exceeded the length of 60 yards, if they attain that. In every place of great resort a monster was the fashion. They sang of it in the cafes, ridiculed it in the papers, and represented it on the stage. All kinds of stories were circulated regarding it. There appeared in the papers caricatures of every gigantic and imaginary creature, from the white whale the terrible Modivik of subarctic regions, to the immense Kraken, whose tentacles could entangle a ship of 500 tons and hurry it into the abyss of the ocean. The legends of ancient times were even revived. Then burst forth the unending argument between the believers and the unbelievers in the societies of the wise and the scientific journals. The question of a monster inflamed all minds. Editors of scientific journals, quarreling with believers in the supernatural, spilled seas of ink during this memorable campaign some even drawing blood, for from the sea serpent they came to direct personalities. During the first months of the year 1867 the question seemed buried, never to revive, when new facts were brought before the public. It was then no longer a scientific problem to be solved but a real danger seriously to be avoided. The question took quite another shape. A monster became a small island, a rock, a reef, but a reef of indefinite and shifting proportions. On the 5th of March, 1867, the Moravian of a Montreal Ocean Company Finding herself during the night in 27 degrees 30 minutes latitude and 72 degrees 15 minutes longitude, struck on her starboard quarter a rock, marked in no chart for that part of the sea. Under the combined efforts of the wine and its 400 horsepower, it was going at the rate of 13 knots. Had it not been for the superior strength of the hull of the Moravian, she would have been broken by the shock and gone down with the 237 passengers she was bringing home from Canada. The accident happened about 5 o'clock in the morning, as the day was breaking. The officers of the quarter deck hurried to the after part of the vessel. They examined the sea with the most careful attention. They saw nothing but a strong eddy about three cables length distant, as if the surface had been violently agitated. The bearings of the place were taken exactly, and the Moravian continued its route without apparent damage. Had it struck on a submerged rock, or on an enormous wreck? They could not tell, but, on examination of the ship's bottom when undergoing repairs, 
it was found that part of her keel was broken. This fact, so grave in itself, might perhaps have been forgotten like many others if, three weeks after, it had not been reenacted under similar circumstances. But, thanks to the nationality of the victim of the shock, thanks to the reputation of the company to which the vessel belonged, the circumstance became extensively circulated. The 13th of April, 1867, the sea being beautiful, the breeze favorable, the Scotia, of the Cunard Company's line, found herself in 15 degrees 12 longitude and 45 degrees 37 latitude. She was going at the speed of 13 knots and half. At 17 minutes past four in the afternoon, whilst the passengers were assembled at lunch in the great saloon, a slight shock was felt on the hull of the Scotia, on her quarter, a little aft of the port paddle. The Scotia had not struck, but she had been struck, and seemingly by something rather sharp and penetrating than blunt. The shock had been so slight that no one had been alarmed, had it not been for the shouts of the carpenter's watch who rushed onto the bridge, exclaiming, We are sinking. We are sinking. At first the passengers were much frightened, but Captain Anderson hastened to reassure them. The danger could not be imminent. The Scotia, divided into seven compartments by strong partitions, could brave with impunity any leak. Captain Anderson went down immediately into the hold. He found that the sea was pouring into the fifth compartment, and the rapidity of the influx proved that the force of the water was considerable. Fortunately this compartment did not hold the boilers, or the fires would have been immediately extinguished. Captain Anderson ordered the engines to be stopped at once, and one of the men went down to ascertain the extent of the injury. Some minutes afterwards they discovered the existence of a large hole, two yards in diameter, in the ship's bottom. Such a leak could not be stopped, and the Scotia, her panels half submerged, was obliged to continue her course. She was then 300 miles from Cape Clear, and, after three days' delay, which caused great uneasiness in Liverpool, she entered the basin of the company. The engineers visited the Scotia, which was put in dry dock. They could scarcely believe it possible. At two yards and half below water mark was a regular rent, in the form of an isosceles triangle. The broken place in the iron plates was so perfectly defined that it could not have been more neatly done by a punch. It was clear, then, that the instrument producing the perforation was not of a common stamp and after having been driven with prodigious strength, and piercing an iron plate one and three-eighths inches thick, had withdrawn itself by a backward motion. Such was the last fact, which resulted in exciting once more the torrent of public opinion. From this moment all unlucky casualties which could not be otherwise accounted for were put down to a monster. Upon this imaginary creature rested the responsibility of all these shipwrecks, which unfortunately were considerable, for of three thousand ships whose loss was annually recorded at Lloyd's, 
the number of sailing and steamships supposed to be totally lost, from the absence of all news, amounted to not less than two hundred. Now, it was a monster who, justly or unjustly, was accused of their disappearance, and, thanks to it, communication between the different continents became more and more dangerous. The public demanded sharply that the seas should at any price be relieved from this formidable cetacean.